This season of the Voyagers podcast has been brought to you by Maui Dream Properties and our friend Jonathan Yudis, realtor and real estate advisor. And we got a question for you. How was the weather at your place today? Not so good, eh? Well, not to rub it in, but here on Maui, the weather has been pretty amazing. Sunny, 82 degrees, crystal clear water, palm trees. If you can see it and you're curious about what life might be like in paradise, I want you to do this. Go to MauiDreamProperties.com. Drop a note of hello to our friend Jonathan, realtor and real estate advisor. Jonathan Yudis works to make people's real estate dreams come true. Whether buying, selling, or investing, he serves his clients with passion and enthusiasm and excellence. And in this business, trust is everything. You've gotten to know Jonathan well. He's a man of integrity and professionalism. He'll go the extra mile to help you find your perfect place. So if you're thinking about moving to one of the most beautiful islands in the world, check out MauiDreamProperties.com and drop Jonathan a hello and get started on making your dream a reality. I'm David Glenn Taylor. And this is the Voyagers Podcast. It's funny how this world works. I am a friendly guy, as you know. As you might not know, I am a huge Lord of the Rings fan. J.R.R. Tolkien and I, I am convinced, would have been best friends. Or at least, I would have bought him a lot of beer just to listen to him tell stories at the pub. When I was a kid... A very brave filmmaker named Ralph Bakshi had been the first to adapt The Lord of the Rings to film, and I'll never forget it because it was unlike anything I had ever seen, and it terrified me and thrilled me. So here I am years later, my family's having dinner at a friend's house here on Maui, and their house is just filled with art. I loved it. Paintings, drawings, posters, sculptures, it's just incredible. And I noticed the name Bakshi everywhere, and I asked my friend Victoria why there's a bunch of Ralph Bakshi's art in her house and she says that's my dad the Ralph Bakshi I ask yep so naturally I begged for an introduction Ralph Bakshi is a legend of American animation the kind they teach you about in film school he pushed the boundaries of what animation could be he challenged everything in the 1970s Ralph created the first x-rated cartoon He claimed cartooning could depict anything and everything, not just a family-friendly Disney fair. And then he turned to fantasy films and eventually The Lord of the Rings, which one could argue has had the largest effect on our current film landscape. If you watch the film, you'll see that, without a doubt, it had a huge influence on Peter Jackson's massively successful films later on. Victoria was gracious to introduce me to her father. We had a lovely discussion over Zoom. We talked about his career and his grandkids and his take on society and art today. And I, for some lucky reason, got to check a conversation off my bucket list. You know, I was thinking about Quentin Tarantino. He wrote the foreword to the, the complete works of, of Ralph Bakshi, and you obviously inspired him. You have inspired many filmmakers, animators over the years. Who's your Quentin Tarantino? Who do you think about? Well, that's a complicated question because, you know, each time period has its own things that are happening that just will never happen again. You know, the right. movie you look, the books you're reading, the music, attitudes of the president and the country. I grew up in a very small section of Brooklyn called Brownsville, which was really a ghetto for escaped European Jews coming out of Russia, escaping Hitler. So this is a very different place. Uh, we were very poor, except we didn't know we were poor. In other words, whatever we got, we were very happy with, we were very satisfied with. We knew we weren't rich, but being poor never bothered us. But on the other hand, the sort of access to movies and different things that would have allowed me to find other people to look at, there was very little of that, if if at all. I mean, I didn't see a Disney film, thank God, until I was about 12 or 13. (laughs) <laughs> so it didn't affect my life like it affected every other animator's life. And I'm nothing against Disney, but you look at Disney and everyone wanted to be Disney. Yeah. So if I had any uh, any sort of people or things that I looked at, it was basically maybe comic books. Yeah. I was crazy over comic books, Superman, Captain Marvel. I was nuts over them. People in the streets were very unusual the characters you run into every day and part of your life, I think, affected me more than anything else. Later on, I got in, involved with people. Later on, I got involved with Max Fleischer. 
right. who I think uh, Betty Boop and Popeye, and I thought the Fleischer cartoons were the greatest shorts ever made. So I love him very much. Then different writers, you know, when you get into the 60s and the 50s, certainly different writers started to affect me. Uh, the underground, Kerouac. So, but when I was very young, I couldn't tell you what a, the people in the streets, my family, the crazy characters every day that showed up on the streets of Brooklyn, I think were the thing that gave me most of my uh, laughs yeah. and, lo and, and loves, you know? Yeah. You live in New Mexico now, and I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about, you know, do you ever make it back to Brownsville? Do you ever go back to New York City? And what that experience is like for you? You know, having well, such an intimate, an intimate experience of growing up on this, on you know, in Brownsville. That's a good question. I can't go back to New York, and I can't go back to Brooklyn because it's not the same I grew up in. Hmm. Uh, whatever has happened to the people, the characters that I grew up in, the, um, including the police who would never pull a gun and shoot anybody in Brownsville. There are a lot of bad guys around. The cops' attitude was they couldn't beat them up with their hands and arrest them. And, let the guy get away. I mean, there wasn't this sort of violence and dislike. People had a lot of respect for each other. A handshake was a handshake. A hot dog was a hot dog. Things were so totally different. I went back to Manhattan about 10 years ago, and I vowed never to go back again because it just wasn't the same place for me. Right. Everybody was separated. The rich was so rich, it was horrible. No one really was taking care of the poor people. Because in our day, when we helped each other, the people in Brownsville took care of each other. The cops took care of us. We respected them. None of the doors were locked, even though Murder Incorporated worked out of a candy store down the block. <laughs> right. um, it was a different kind of time. It was a time of ideas. It was a time of hope. In other words, one could dream and hope that words and great books and editorials could change how people feel. There was the backlash against the Nazis in Europe, which was very important to me. My, what affected my films and my life was I used to sit home, and every couple of weeks, my mother would get a letter from Europe that one of her relatives was dead. Now, that's due to being Jewish and due to being caught and killed by the Nazis. So there's no going back to the time I grew up in, a kind of a delusion with the whole thing that books... I'm sorry to say that books and ideas will change the world until I see it. Nobody's accountable for anything today. And in my day, everybody was accountable. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a great president. And we won World War II the right way. And we had the civil rights movement, which certainly offered hope yeah. to millions of underclass Americans. So uh, it was a different time and place. I live in New Mexico on top of a mountain, which is very pure, it's very beautiful, it's very quiet, there are no billboards. Yeah. I could do my art and stay away from what I disliked so much in the cities, which was uh, the tremendous difference between the, those that have and those that have not. You know, I actually lived in Gallup, New Mexico for three and a half years. I taught school, I taught, an, I taught art out there. At a, at a little school just outside oh, yeah. of Gallup. Yeah, I, and I loved it. You're an interesting guy. <laughs> well, it was funny when, when Victoria told me that you you lived out in New Mexico, I thought, you know, when I moved from, you know, Seattle and I lived in Anchorage, Alaska for a while, and then I moved to New Mexico, the aesthetic was so different with the desert and with the, the landscape. And I was, and it shifted the way that I was doing my art. And it certainly watching the students work in the way that they did. And most of my students were Navajo. And I'm curious about what that aesthetic shift did for you in terms of when you moved out there, what it did to you artistically. Well, first of all, the, the, the purity of being out here is what I love. In other words, the land is the land is the land as it always was, at least where I live. Right. The sand, the desert, the rocks, the trees, they're, they're, they are true to themselves as they always were. And there's a great purity to that. The air is clear, the skies are clear. The falseness of the city finally caught up to me. And how it affected my art is I'm able to produce more. I see. More of what I want to do. I'm at a point in my life where I just look inside myself. Because I've always been an artist who would subconsciously drag out from themselves the kind of things that were murking around in my head without me realizing until they came out. Right. I still operate that way. When I sit down to draw a picture, I have no idea of what I'm going to draw. I have no, uh, I set no rules and I start to draw. It's, it's like walking on a tightrope. Right. Um, 
whoever comes out is always a, a big surprise to me. So I'm that kind of artist. That's why I love Jackson Pollock and de Kooning very much, along with others. So the kind of artist I am, and I don't look at, I don't look at the landscape and say, gee, I want to copy that. I don't understand what the point of that would be. So I'm more interested in what am I thinking about that I don't know I'm thinking about. What New Mexico and the desert and the mountains and all the beautiful landscape here allows me to do is think clearly. I'm not jumbled by all this stuff coming at me all the time. Sure. Um, fancy cars and nightclubs and everything else that happened, the CBGBs and the heebie-jeebies and all this stuff. <laughs> I grew up in the 60s on St. Mark's with all the hippies, you know. There isn't stuff coming at me all the time that really interferes. Yeah. And the law interferes with, I'm not the kind of artist that looks at things to interpret them. And I'm just trying to interpret what I don't know I'm ready to interpret. Right. Of course, I also lose a lot of pictures that way, a lot of stuff. <laughs> If I threw a picture, becomes I can't control it anymore. It's not going anywhere, and it goes in the garbage. Sure. Uh, but I enjoy that very much. So New Mexico is probably the best move Liz and I made in our whole life. I wish people were as pure as New Mexico. Yeah, beautiful. Because I've grown cynical, as you can see. Your work's always pushed the boundaries of kind of what a cartoon was, what it is, what it was expected. You were the kind of the anti, you were the yin to Disney's yang. I went to People's Cinema in Brownsville. It was a cheap... <laughs> <laughs> People's Cinema was a, was a movie house that started in the Depression for poor people. It was 10 cents to get in instead of a quarter, which all, like, all the other theaters were. Right. And it had three movies, 50 cartoons, 50, 50 <laughs> cartoons, shorts, all the cheap shorts, Terry Toons, Warner Brothers, you know, the really crazy stuff, <laughs> newsreels, and coming attractions. And we sat there all day for 10 cents. And what I saw in that movie theater was Laurel and Hardy. They, they showed old movies. Yeah. Laurel and Hardy, the Marx Brothers, you know, the Three <laughs> Stooges. Oh, God, I love Laurel and Hardy. Back to influences, those are my influences. Right. Those maniacs. <laughs> yeah. Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello. And then they would show the, they, they would show old films, black and white, The Wolfman. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> Frankenstein. And I sat there for 10 cents all day, which I could afford if you don't buy candy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's why I never saw a Disney cartoon that affected me till I was at an age when I was born Mitzvah at 13 I had a date that afternoon I couldn't wait for my grandfather and all my family to get out of the synagogue they're all partying in my house and I had to sneak out because I had a date in the movie house with a girl I was 13 <laughs> in the movie and I paid for her to go in it was 25 cents it cost me an extra quarter I nearly died <laughs> <laughs> but it was a girl, you know. Yeah. I don't know what a girl was at that point. <laughs> but I wasn't affected by Disney, so I am his yin to yang or whatever. In terms of the media and how people were taken in, especially when you started, you know, with Fritz the Cat and you started working on films that were, were adult themed, it became very much how people were perceiving it as the kind of the anti-Disney. It, it was that Disney had claimed cartoons for the family realm and that and that it was, for many people, it was kind of this violation of this this sacred thing i'm i'm assuming and, and from what i know of you you took that on as a personal hey th i'm gonna play this role and i'm gonna push art as far as i can you nailed do, it do you see anybody today that's playing that role against the big superhero movies and everything else so let me go back again to what i'm saying about times are different yes um, let me take a step back with first of all, you, you're 100 right and you articulated it better than anyone about the fact that I took that role on because it was forced on me, number two, and played it because it was commercially viable. I said to myself, you know, number two, I really dislike the entire animation industry and the Disney company for these reasons. The Disney films that they made were great. The Disney films they were making in the 60s and were terrible. You know, yeah. Robin Hood, and uh, they really had run out of steam. The fact that all the animators at Disney thought that there wasn't any other cartoonist in the world animator, not me. The guys that worked for me were brilliant. They were short animators from Warner Brothers and everything. That they weren't as good as they were. They called themselves the nine old men. So they thought they owned animation. Right. And every animator in the business and every animation critic and every animation historian would make their living off of Disney. You know, pu Disney publishing would give them books to write and 
So everything was Disney. Disney was great. Disney was this. Disney didn't do what I was getting ready to do. Disney didn't do anything during World War II that he should have done. You know, yeah. Disney showed up at, at the Walt Disney himself showed up at the uh, McCarthy hearings and didn't do very well for the people out there who were trying to keep earn their livings by writing what they felt. Right. And the whole company wasn't really what I felt was going on in the 60s in, in America. We were right. fighting in Vietnam. We were protesting for black equality and we're protesting the war. There's nothing to do with Disney and the fact that they took this stance. And when I started to animate Fritz, as you so wisely put, the entire industry turned on me. Mm -hmm. Every critic turned on me. Mm -hmm. The Disney guy, when I came to Hollywood from New York, when I moved Fritz the Cat to LA, the Variety, which was a key paper in LA, had a full page ad that someone came to my office and gleefully showed me a full page ad in Variety that says that I should go home, that the great Disney tradition I'm stepping on, and it was signed by all these animators. No kidding. Oh, no, it's there. And, you know, it struck me very hard because I was an animator. Yeah. Plus, I was an artist. Number two, the fact that I was doing R-rated movies seemed to have not matter. There was a rating system that protected me. Right. I wasn't doing kids' films. I was doing what I wanted to do. The fact that an animator could own his own studio, do what he wanted to do, should have rallied the animation industry behind me, but it did the opposite effect. Huh. I was the antichrist to Disney. So that's, you're exactly right. So the point is, um, Disney's early films were absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Disney wasn't the only animation. Max Fleischer shorts were better than Disney shorts as far as I'm concerned, as far as yeah. humor. And if you look at them today, that's all you see is Max Fleischer on the YouTube and, and it right. blows Disney shorts away. So they were a better studio. Max Fleischer, poor guy, he wanted to be Disney. He, he didn't think he was as good as Disney because a lot of animators that used to work for Fleischer started to work for me. And they used to tell me, no, none of these animators that performed so well with me, with no money. Yeah. We had no, Disney had $20 million to make a film in the 60s. I had 1 million. We didn't care. I took these animators who used to animate shorts and they just sat down and did it. We never looked at it. We never shot it. We never tested it. It went from their desk to the animation camera. That's how great those animators were. They were my nine old men or 10 or 15. Uh, they were better than any Disney animators because of their spontaneity, not because of their craftsmanship. But I felt that their honesty and their animation style, which was very loose and very cartoony, which is something yeah. I was interested in. Yeah. I wasn't interested in that Disney perfection. Number <laughs> one, I could not afford it. Yeah. Number two, it was boring. Yeah. I felt it was boring. I had a wonderful time with a bunch of guys that believed in me. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it called me an anti. So, of course, you know, if a, if a newspaper reporter thought that was something she could talk about, talk away, you know, have fun. <laughs> I, so it wasn't anti Disney quality, I was anti Disney's attitude, and still am. I'm 44. I didn't know you were an artist. I started out as a graphic designer, um, but I was an, a, you know, just an avid drawer and, and doing art. And, um, and I was just passionate about cartoons when I was a kid as well, just doodling and animation of any kind. Are you still doing that? I, um, yes. No, and I kick your ass. Well, in fact, it's interesting because <laughs> when, when I no, talked, no, when no, I got no. to know, when I got to know Victoria and I had asked her about, Man, I said, I really love to talk to your dad on the podcast. What it did was it got me looking more back at cartoons. And I have all these books on cartoons and books of, you know, of work. And I, and I started drawing cartoons again, which I haven't done in a long time. I started just kind of picking up my sketch pad and I found myself doodling and drawing more, more and more cartoons again. And Thank God. Fun. You know, drawing, drawing is everything. Yeah. You should never stop drawing because I get really angry at you. And as far as cartooning goes, you should take the same attitude. I took out of cartoons are more than we think they are. Yeah. And a hundred years from now, you just keep drawing. Yeah. Do you do do you draw regularly just as a practice? What? Do you I draw eight hours a day every day? How long? Eight, seven, eight hours a day every day. No I love kidding. It. There's nothing else I want to do. Wow. That's I mean, I, I go, I eat, I yeah. bother Liz, you know, <laughs> I watch a movie. But the point is I'm out of that. I wouldn't know what to do. In fact, that's all I ever was about. Right. I was only about drawing. 
I'm yeah. still only about drawing, whether it's that's animation or on a paper piece. And that's whether anyone looks at it or not. Right, right. Okay, so let me ask you some questions about Lord of the Rings. I saw, I like saw this. You like that answer? Yeah, that was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> this is all great. For me, sir, I'm like, I, I'm, I, I, Lord of the Rings question. Go okay, ahead. Lord of the Rings question. The film itself, uh, or the books themselves, I'm curious about when you first read it. I'm also curious, that did you ever get a chance to meet Professor Tolkien? We go back in time. First of all, yes. in the 60s, when I was growing up at the animation company, I was doing animation, I was doing The Mighty Heroes. There was an underground book being read by certain cartoonists and people. The word was getting out. Mm -hmm. And that book was called Lord of the Rings. Right. And I don't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> and there were little whispers about it and discussions. You'd hear some artists take tell another artist, Lord of the Rings. So... There was this underground movement that the hippies were, and of course, with their movement against power and right. with their movement against Vietnam, you could understand when you read the books. Absolutely. Number two, I finally got a hold of a copy from a great cartoonist who gave me his copy, and I took it home and started to read it and was blown away. Yeah. Every day after work, I go, I spent the next year reading all three books quietly in my living room after supper on a couch. And Tolkien's one of the greatest writers in the entire world. His world that he created blew me away. It was so yeah. beautifully written. Yeah. It was so perfect. Uh, now, Tolkien was writing during World War II in England. So you, I understand that a lot of the emotion on the book is what's going on in World War II, where England's right. getting bombed and the Nazis are going. So, you know... You could see, like I said earlier, everything, when you're part of a time period, there are other things happening that make things happen. Right. So Tolkien was driven by World War II, I'm sure, in the darkness that was befalling England, London, and Europe. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. I mean, that's psychologically, whether we knew it or not, or whether we, I'm not saying everything is on top of your head. These are the things churning inside of you that you don't, you might not know are there, and they produce art and music. Right. That's why it's so much great. Look at Dylan and all the great music he wrote. In, because the stuff was churning around inside that you didn't know was there. Right. Yeah. And you can't do it again. Whereas yeah. once you pass that time period, you try to go back. That's why when you try to go back, it doesn't work. Right. you got to right. be part of your time period. Right. The minute yeah. you go back, you have no idea. All these Disney guys today that try to go back to the good old days of Disney have no idea of the beauty and the love and the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and and all the stuff that was churning in those Disney animated to make those early great films. Sure. Unless you're back there, you can't do that. Right. All right. So I read Tolkien because it was a big hit in the underground before it became a big hit in the overground. Yeah. All right. Let me meet Tolkien. No, he, was, he, he, he had died. But I did meet his daughter. And I did meet his son in England. And I did see where Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings oh, wow. in Oxford in a little... You went up a long flight of stairs and in his little attic on top in Oxford, he wrote the things. And his daughter showed me his drawing. He did a lot of things for rings. And they happened to have had an exhibition in Oxford that was closed at the time of his drawings. But she opened up and showed it to me. Oh, wow. To say the least, I was stunned. I mean, I was on my best behavior. Um, <laughs> I was totally stunned. I had gone there to get their okay to do the film. In other words, right. I was so in love with Tolkien and so respectful of his work that I wasn't going to do his films without some okay from the family. I just wasn't. I wasn't going to do it. Right. So I had to get an okay, which drove my producer, Saul Zenz, crazy. Yeah. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm not going to do it if they don't want to let me do it. Yeah. They don't want me to do because before that, guess who owned the rights to Lord of the Rings? Disney. Disney. Oh no! If Disney owned the rights to Lord of the Rings. Could not do it. It was too harsh for them. Sure, so they sure. sold it to United Artists. Okay. So United Artists, the film company, gets the rights, right? Right. So this for Disney. So they gave it to this guy, this this film director Borman. Now Borman takes looks at the three books and says, you know. I'm going to take all three books and make it into one film. And I'm going to add characters, my own characters, to make it oh, work. No. <laughs> he writes the script. No, this is true. He writes the script for United Artists. Now, how do I know this? Because United Artists puts out a PR article telling me all this. So he oh, writes this script for United Artists who don't want to do it. <laughs> they okay, don't want to do it. They don't want to thank her. 
They don't want to do, or they do want to do it. I'm not sure, but I, I read it and, and never forget it in variety. And I say, this can't be happening. I also had a lot of muscle at that point. So I the kind of balls that only Ellie has. So, <laughs> so I make a call for the head of United Artists who knew me, because I was pretty much a Hollywood establishment to yell at at that point. Mm. Uh, and I have a meeting with him and I tell him, you can't do this. He said, you can't make you can't make these great books into one picture with with um, new characters added. What are you out of your mind? He says, his name was Mike Metavoy, the head of UUA. And he says, Ralph, I never read the script and I never read the books. I don't understand any of it. <laughs> I says, okay, give me the rights and I'll make it in three pictures. He says, okay, this is unheard of. Yeah. I'm in his office. Give me the rights, right? So wow. when agents is running around buying, selling rights, rights are a major occupation in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. He says, I'll give you the right if you get me back by three million that we form in <laughs> to write the script <laughs> and to do the picture. So you gotta get three and a half million dollars to write a script, right? Wow. If I get back to it, I said, You got it, no problem. This is true. Wow. This is the kind wow. of guy I was. All right, now, United Artists had rented space in MGM Studio. It was United Artists Company and MGM Company. They were and now on the same floor level. You got it? Yeah, yeah. So I walk out of Metavoy's office. I walk into MGM's office. The guy who was running MGM, his name was uh, Dan Melnick. He's a good guy. Yeah. Dan Melnick eventually produced all that jazz. Yeah. He produced the dance with me. He was a very, very intellectual guy. And he ran MGM. And I knew, he, he, I never met him, but he was very intellectual. And he was Jewish. I think I could talk to a Jew. So I, <laughs> so I walk into his office and the secretary says, yeah. I said, I'm here to see Dan. She says, do you have an appointment? I said, no. He says, you can't just walk in here. She, she said, anyhow, I was in a meeting with a director. Some director's pitching a movie to him. I said, look, I'm going to walk out of here. But before I do that, I'm if you don't want to lose your job, you better buzz daddy and tell him Ralph Bakshi is out here with the rights to Lord of the Rings. <laughs> you tell him that, I said. I figured if he doesn't know, he doesn't know. But if he knows, I'm in the room. Right? Right. And she says, what? I said, yeah. She says, and I said, if he finds out that I left and you didn't do that, he's going to fire you. Wow. Oh. So she, yeah. so she buzzes him and they used to tell him, right? 10 seconds go by, 20 seconds go by. The door to his office flies open. He says, Ralph, come on in. Also, who is leaving is the director who's furious at me because I broke up a bitch. But you know, yeah. you can't get in those offices. Yeah. And when you get in those offices, you don't get up a meeting. He hated my guts, but every time he saw me at a Hollywood party, he kind of, he would get fits of rage. I was like, what am I supposed to do? I said, yeah. I didn't know who was you. If I knew it was you, I still would have done it, but I didn't know it was you. Yeah. <laughs> right. I walk in, he knew what the rings were. I mean, sure. my bet had paid, he knew. Yeah. This is a true story. None of this is made up. You can, this could only happen under my Brownsville tuition. Right. <laughs> we get up, we walk a, from his office to the office I just came from, and he tells Metavoy that we want the rights, we're going to do the movie, and here's your three and a half million dollars. Boom. And I got the rights to Lord of the Rings. Boom. Just like that. Just like that. That's just crazy. like that. <laughs> now, I didn't have an agent. And now you're talking about my background. So now the earlier question comes into play very carefully. Sure. Having no known protocol in Hollywood, but having no known protocol in Brownsville, having no understanding of how things work, I barely graduated high school if I graduated at all. Having none of those dreams about going to college, just wanted to go to work, left me on my own. Sure. And if you're on your own, you're on your own. So whatever you're thinking about, you can pull off. You just try. Yeah. It's not that you feel so brave, but there is no other way that you understand. In other words, sure. if Danny's across the hall and Metaboy wants his money, all I got to do is go and talk Danny to get me. To me, it's very simple. It's like going from one candy store to the delicatessen. You know, it's mm -hmm. like it's like maneuvering junior high school. You know, try mm -hmm. to make sure you don't get beat up by all the gangs. You know, it's right. it's part of how I grew up. It's not looking at Disney and wishing upon a star. You do it yourself. Right. You know, what have stars got to do with wishing? <laughs> you want something done, you go ahead and you do it. You know? <laughs> and if yeah. your nose grows because you lie, so what? Right. Jews got big noses anyhow, they say. Right. So, 
<laughs> so that's how I got the rights. Wow. You go to shoot the film. I mean, it's it's really well known now. And there's been, you know, many people working on, you know, the Den Lord of the Rings in film. And we've had um, Amazon.com has a $500 million budget for their new Lord of the Rings epic set in the second age there that's coming out in 2022. These Because the scope of the thing is so big that many people thought it was impossible. I mean, it was just impossible. You not only decided to make it, but you also decided to make it using rotoscope technology. So you're shooting a live action film and you're, and then you're animating it. How long did that take you from start to finish? A year and a couple of months. In the first two minutes of uh, the live action Lord of the Rings, the first minute or two, they used up every penny I had on my <laughs> animation budget. Uh, the rotoscope technique was the only way to do it because it was a certain realism. I got yelled at for that, except everything in film today is called motion control. It's all rotoscope. Yeah. Every special effect film, all the orcs in live action, everything done today is called motion control. Yeah. I called it rotoscope, and every animator yelled at me. Right. They call it motion control, and they're heroes. That's the kind of, <laughs> uh, that's the kind of thing I was always up against for some yeah. reason. Yeah. But it wasn't any different how I grew up. In other words, this is how it is. You know, if you're living in a ghetto, you know, things are people are always trying to kill you. It's no big sure. deal. But I did it because it had to be done. I wanted to do it. Right. In other words, it's for me, it's never the act. I'd like to get $100 million a minute to do a movie. Sure. A lot of stuff that I could not get on Lord of the Rings still bothers me. Sure. sure. But better than not do it, I'd rather do it. The whole art of making a drawing, whether it's good or bad, is doing it. I'm an artist. So yeah. the point is, I don't care. Good, bad, half good. You give it everything you got. Mm -hmm. You try it. Plus, I was in control. I ran my own company. Right. So the joy of every idea that comes into my head, I'm able to use. You have to understand how much fun I had. On right. all my films, I never had to ask anybody. By yeah. the way, yeah. nobody from Lord of the Rings, the live action version, even ever sent me a thank you note. Even though they used my designs and everything. Or even yeah. a bottle of wine. Yeah. So that director is part of what has happened to America sure. and the world today is yeah. a lack of historic understanding sure. of what came before them. Victoria told me, don't bring up Peter Jackson. I just and, did. Yeah, I know, you just did, so. Yeah, I just did. <laughs> Can I, so can I ask you a question about that? I just did. Yeah, don't. Okay, all right. <laughs> ask me. Go ahead, ask me. Um, did you see the films, the Peter Jackson films? No. Didn't see him. No. And 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 that whole on uh, purpose. On purpose. I just I didn't want sure. to look at it. Sure. I don't know why I didn't want to see him. He had all that money. Yeah. I knew he had taken a lot of stuff from me. Yeah. I didn't want to get aggravated. So yeah. yeah. In fact, his in secret. He sent his assistant woman to come to my uh, Comic-Con booth. I have to be there that day. My son and Eddie and Victoria do it. Yeah. And she says, can I see all the Lord of the Rings drawings you have? So they bought a ton of Lord of the Rings drawings and backgrounds. Oh, no. I wanted to look at the style. But I knew who she was. Yeah. But she, you know, so uh, wow. anyhow. So I'll then take, they... <laughs> I'll take his money. Go ahead. <laughs> so then maybe a better question. Uh, Tolkien, uh, Christopher Tolkien, be, continued to publish so much of, of Professor Tolkien's work out, even after he passed away, taking his notes and compiling it, and even publishing books in just the last few years, some of his stories um, from the first and second age of Middle Earth. And, and did, have you read any of those? Christopher Tolkien came to me with the Cimmerillions. Oh, he did. And wanted me to make them as a movie. No kidding. Uh, yes, yes. I read it, did not like it. In other words, I was through with Tolkien. Right. Uh, I had spent every ounce of shooting in Spain and around the clock, seven days a week, trying to finish his picture. Sure. I was done with it. In other sure. words, even if I loved it, I wouldn't have done it. Um, but what I read didn't seem to me that Tolkien would want it released. That sure. sure. There was just oh. no, I don't know that to be the yeah. case. No, that's interesting because I, I've, you know, I've read, this is how much of a, kind of a geek I am. I've read every single thing that Tolkien ever wrote, including all his, you know, Finn and Hengest and, you know, Reverandum and some of his to totally random pieces that he did. Right. 
Um, because in the, when I first read Lord of the Rings, I became somewhat obsessed, especially with the themes you were referring to. You were talking about how the themes were resonating and Lord of the Rings were resonating at the time you were in because of the Vietnam War. He was writing during World War II. He served in World War One. He was in the trenches on the Western oh, yeah, Front. Yeah, I didn't know that. I mean, yeah, because he was a signalman for, for uh, the English military and, on, and he was on the Western Front for two years. He I was, didn't know that. He was literally in the trenches writing poetry. Wow. Yeah, he was writing writing elvish poetry and inventing languages while bombs are going off the top of his head. Unbelievable. And Life is so peculiar. But we haven't had war. War has completely changed in the way that it that it it functions now. And so Viet is almost like the Vietnam War, or the Korean War were the last very, very personal very personal wars that really enveloped a whole country. So I'm interested in, because right now we have the, the explosion is superhero movies. We have just this massive inundation in movies that are just, it's every move, every other movie is a superhero movie. And I'm wondering what does that say about us or what are your opinions about what does that say about us as a society in America right now? Well, that's a good question. Look, first of all, I only have, only have my ideas, which are only my ideas. So I don't, I'm just, I can only tell you what I think yeah. doesn't make it real or right. Yeah, no, we're, we're I'm very much interested in your ideas. <laughs> no, no, but understand, I want to do a disclaimer because sure. um, yeah, I'll say it. I am very worried, thoroughly disappointed and disgusted with society in America and probably the world today. Okay. Yeah. When I was growing up, I felt that words like Tolkien, essays, great writers, great movements like the civil rights movement. There are black guys getting shot in their cars for not having the right signal lights on and the cops are still walking around free. The rich have gotten so rich, the poor are so poor, that all these great books and novels and forward movements, black lives haven't changed one bit. The racism in this country is gonna kill us. It's as big as it's ever been. You got people marching down streets with Donald Trump, you know, who are hating Jews and blacks in the open with their signs with Donald Trump says they're not bad people. All of that has led me to believe that something has happened to America. But if you think that Nancy Pelosi and the crew of Democrats were any better or not to blame, they are to blame also. They allowed this disparity to happen. They allowed people to be marginalized. They allowed crazy far left movements, like just like far right movements, run the agenda. It's like the country's being run by, by movements on the far left and the far right when we have to be closer together so we can compromise, which is what democracy is about. There is no such thing as a superhero. It's like, you know, you don't have to worry about the problem. We'll get these guys with capes to fix it. Ah, uh, yeah. That's it. There's no ideas. Right. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. What thing gives you joy right now? During the painting. The one thing that always kept me together and made me want to get up. That's all. That's all I, that's all I care about. Yeah. And my grandkids, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but uh, you know, my I, wife. I mean, look at me, bro, my wife. But to think that I do, yeah, it's drawing and painting, writing, tr thinking that movies could change the world for the better. It's sure. finished with me. It's finished. Yeah. I was shocked when I first started reading the complete works of Ralph Bakshi and I saw these pictures of you as a young man and they looked so much like William. I was just blown away. And I, I actually texted Victoria and said, he looks just like William. <laughs> like, they look so similar. William is so great. He's, a, he's busy in the jungle over there painting a shit. I... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's so, well, him and him and my youngest son, Micah, my 11 year old Micah, he idolizes William and he's let, he's let Micah come over and help him a little bit. And they, and he's just, uh, he just wants to, he just all, now all he talks about is trying to build something like what William has built in the forest there. He just wants to do it at our house. He wants to, he wants this massive playground to play in. They came over to, before, before the virus, they came, William and Miles, my other grandson came to my house to live yeah. and they built at a, we have a lot of dead wood around here. Yeah. It's desert. You know, lying on the ground. Right. They built huge houses in the back there out of dead wood. 
I had it when they left. I had to tear it down because I was afraid of a fire hazard. Sure, yeah. I'm very worried about fire up there. There's just yeah. no water. They spent all day building this city, and it worked. I mean, yeah. I love. Uh, yeah, he's an amazing kid. He's an amazing kid. Where did Victoria get her laugh? Ellie. <laughs> really? She got a laugh from Let me tell you about Ellie. Okay. Yes, Ellie, please. Ellie. Eve, <laughs> Tia gave me Bailey her dog. She gave yeah. me a dog to take here because her dog, Bailey, which we still have, yeah. right, would bite everyone that came to the house. In LA <laughs> and in Hawaii, wherever she's living in Maui, would chew people up alive. <laughs> Come there, Bailey, uh, chugs. The cops came to kill him twice. Tia broke down in tears. Yeah. In LA, they were going to shoot him because they kept getting these people calling him. Oh, yeah, no. he was a So she gives it to me. And I love the dog because he's crazy. Like <laughs> <laughs> fuzzy. He looks so harmless and he'll kill you. <laughs> so I'm sitting with Ben. So Tia comes up with Ellie. Uh, she's about five years old at this point. And Ellie's, so I'm sitting with, with Bailey on my couch. I love him. I'm rubbing him. And Ellie's walking now five years old. And she says, my dog. I says, I'm not. I say, my dog. She puts her hands on her hips. Five years old. Puts both hands on her hips, turns to me and says out loud, he was my dog before he was your dog. We all laughed so hard. I never saw Tia laugh so hard in life. It was the funniest thing I've ever seen a kid do in my whole life. <laughs> he was my dog. I mean, she was going to beat me up. But the fact <laughs> that they came out of her mouth, he was my dog before he was your dog. She's 100% right. Yeah, yeah. I gave her the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Tia learned to laugh because of Ellie, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, Ellie and my son, my middle son, Noah, have become really good friends. And, and I know, awesome. but yeah. So let me tell you my, my last Maui story for your head. Yeah, please. Okay. The plane ride, the two plane ride. I'm too old. I'm 82. You're right. I go to the bathroom every three minutes. It's just, <laughs> it's so, not really, it would so be so discomforting to ride sure. on a plane. Sure. I also don't like to fly all of a yeah. sudden. Yeah. But I went to Maui. I had just finished Lord of the Rings. I went to Maui for a vacation. I was exhausted. Yeah. It was a plane with my wife, Elizabeth, who yeah. found it. On Maui, there was some sort of very fancy resort. And at the resort was uh, a bunch of actors who I knew. They, very famous actors. It was very swanky. I've never been to Maui. And I'm there for I land to go there. We, we, we fly in from Hawaii on a small plane. We land. I go to the bar. I have a margarita. I'm exhausted from the plane trip. In. I go out, I'm leaving the bar, and there's a basketball court. And these guys, these Hawaiians are shooting basketball, these guys are dribbling around. I'm going to show them Brooklyn basketball. Sure. So it just rained. So I go out on the basketball court, I take a drum shot. They pass me the ball. I take a drum shot, my foot slips out, and I break my leg in three spots. Oh, no. I am lying, I am lying on the basketball court in Maui. So they put me, they call for a Plane. The plane is a small two-engine plane. They stick me in the back of the plane behind the pilot, like a long... They lie me down in the back of the plane behind the pilot. Pilot takes off. There's just was a tremendous storm. All I see through his window are clouds, black, and we're swooping, and I'm in agony. <laughs> and they take me to this island. They drag me out from the back of the plane, which is like being in your own coffin. Yeah. You know, the roof slopes down and you're lying there. Now, mind you, I'm only in bed. Been, this is my vacation. Oh, man. So I get to this hospital and a doctor who served in Vietnam stands me up. I said, I can't stand up. He says, Stand up. I can't stand. stand up. He stands me up I'm holding onto the bed and he yanks my leg down. The pain was like, I nearly passed out. And later on, he says, That's what we learned in Vietnam. He says, <laughs> Says you've got to walk on the brake. He makes me walk after we did oh that. Oh my god! You got to walk on the brake for it to heal. We learned that the bones rub together again; they heal faster. Look at this, out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I am going back to Maui. Okay. That's I, mean, I don't want to. 
because I'll break my neck next time. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I that's a, that's a, you have to tear. That's a true story. Yeah. Yeah. I was on Maui for two hours. I flew back. Wow. Stayed in bed and we flew to, to LA. And in another storm, the plane gets deserted to San Francisco. Oh, and I got a cast up to my neck. Oh, and man. on and on and on Maui goes. That's I will horrible. never return to Maui. <laughs> So I wish you guys luck. I, I hey, you. Maybe we'll make it out to New Mexico. Come yeah. to the Gulf of Mexico. I'll meet you there. Hey, I, I would love, I'm, I'm really missing the green chili, so I wouldn't mind getting out there and, and that would be good. So there's one last thing that we do on the show. And every time I interview someone, I always at the end, I ask them to kind of leave a blessing for the audience or just a piece of advice or something that they, that, that, that they want to kind of give to the audience. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. I love it. I'll trust anyone, so just be curious. Goodbye. Mr. Bakshi, thank you so much for your time. Have fun. <laughs> Will do. The Voyagers podcast is produced by Sugar Sled Productions and recorded in Kula on the island of Maui. And it's hosted by me, David Glintoon. My warmest thanks to Ralph and his wife, Liz, for graciously spending some time with me and letting me pick Ralph's brain. It was truly an honor. And thanks to Victoria for introducing us. After our conversation, I was smiling from ear to ear for a while because how often do you get to meet a legend? I mean, that was pretty amazing. I'm still tickled about how lucky I am. If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening. It's really appreciated. You can support the podcast through Patreon by going to voyagerspodcast.com and clicking on the Patreon link. And if you'd like to sponsor, you can email us, david at voyagerspodcast.com. And I really appreciate those of you who have left reviews. It's good to know how we're doing. Next week, I get to introduce you to a good friend and a local legend, Brian Hustis. We talk about obsession, specifically regarding the ocean. Brian has been in the water just about every day for close to 30 years. When I heard that, I had to know why. How does a human connect to nature in that way? Brian shares some stories of the ocean, the waves, and oh yeah, that tiger shark. That's next week on the Voyagers Podcast. Mahalo for listening, friends.